the first question is just um, what is your best definition of activism uh, that you may have come across or that you have uh, sort of developed uh, as an original um, concept of the word? Activism. Mm. Mm. It's an interesting one. Uh, right. Right, what's my best? Right, I'll be honest with you, okay, right. It bothers me when people call me an activist because usually for me it's almost like it's pejorative and it's almost like, you know, like some kind of maverick troublemaker who's just creating issues out of nothing. It's a bit like the word radical when people yep. call me radical. So for me, um, although Black History Studies always call me the warrior no, no, they call me the warrior scholar. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> I'd more see myself as that, to be honest. Yeah. Because I think I'm just a natural African warrior, which is why my Yoruba friends tell me that I'm Ajagun, which means warrior. Yeah. Or, right. but because to be honest, when it comes to a, a good way, I could I could explain it, and it's kind of sort of um, bastardizing Antonio Gramsci's notion of hegemony and basically it works a bit like this so you'll have somebody who comes up from the grassroots and they will be an activist they will be for this and for that and they're fighting against this and they're fighting against that and then all of a sudden it's like many of them get incorporated into the system they're fighting against now i don't want to really be disparaging because i do have a lot of I have a lot of respect for Doreen Lawrence, but it kind of surprised me based on the activism, because remember, if it wasn't for her, no double jeopardy law, mm. her and her husband, to a point, there'd be no d double jeopardy law in criminal justice while those two devils, racists, are in prison. That's right. Okay. And if it wasn't for the fact that, that they were so steadfast and, and supported by you know, wonderful QC Michael Mansfield and people like that, you know, the people who supported them, there would have been no justice for their son. So that would have just been another African victim of white racism, white supremacist thought and action. So I commend her on her stance. And again, unlike her husband, who was out of his Christian sensibilities, forgiven the murderers, which oh, it's nearly making me choke to yeah. talk about it. Yeah. She didn't. But as I said, for me, it's like she's still an activist, but I can't really equate how you will then go into that. It's, it, it almost seems to uh, conflict with the very... Yeah, uh, it's, it's anathema. It's like antithetical to me. Yeah. Yes, yes. But where I would throw in is we're all different. We have our own journeys and paths. Yeah. Because I'll be honest with you, I cannot, you know, and people can get upset, but I really don't care anyway. Like, all of these people running around with these honorary titles, honorary doctor, honorary professor, and MBEs, OBEs, CBEs, damehoods, knighthoods, to me, they're all the same. And the reason why I say that is because generally the people who get these honorary titles are the ones who are the most community active. And I know we've had pe people like Prof Gus John mm. and Benjamin Zephaniah and other people have directly <laughs> refused to accept them. Yeah. Because I think they operate out of the same kind of mindset as me. Why do you want to be lauded and applauded for your activism by the society by the you're active yeah. really against? Yeah. So I've never, ever been able to get my head around it because for me, we do what we do as, as in the, we're speaking in the context of peoples of African ancestry. We're Africans. We're doing it because these are the same people who dehumanized us. They reduced us to three fifths of a human being. No members of the human family have ever been reduced to an article of commerce, none. Now, where people get a little bit confused, and it's interesting because I'm actually 
writing up some of the module specs for this new MA that we hope is going to kick off this year. Okay. In global Black Studies, Decolonization and Social Justice. And one of the things we're premising... I might on, have to get on that, Prof. <laughs> let me tell you, one of the things, sis, it's going to be revolutionary. I, I, and that, it's going that, to be revelatory because, one, we are not going to talk about slavery because Africans did not go through slavery as unfreedom. We actively fought against chattel enslavement, mm. which dehumanised us. Now, where people kind of get a little bit confused when I say we were reduced to three-fifths of a human being, they say, oh, yes, but, you know, it was in America under the Southern Voting Rights and whatever. We know for a fact that the people who initiated the system of institutionalised chattel enslavement were Queen Elizabeth and the people here. Other mm. people were, f were foraging into the continent and doing certain things to us and, you know, duping us and we were duping them and whatever. You know, we can go back to Prince Henry the Navigator to discuss that. But I'm talking about the institutionalised, racist, dehumanised project was created here. Mm. The people who dominate and racially abuse us in America are who? Not the same people for us Mm, the same absolutely. ones who are in Australia. Absolutely. So when I when people say to me, "Oh yes, but you know, um, Doctor Les, Prof Les, you're talking about under the American Constitution," I say to them, "Listen," and I think I might have mentioned this in our discussions before. David Cameron and probably Boris Johnson and all of them. They're, they're, David Cameron, we know for a fact, his family were involved in African chattel enslavement. They made money out of it. Now, if you if you did a cursory glance at his family tree, you are going to bet your bottom dollar dad links in America to slave owners in the Americas. You will bet your bottom dollar dad links to slave owners, not just in the Caribbean, but in the Americas. Because when we talk about African chattel enslavement and how it manifested in the Americas, mm. we are talking about the same people over here negotiating with the same people over there. Remember what they say, they're, what, what is it they say, the special relationship yeah. between Britain and America. It's never changed mm. because they're the same family. So my point is this, if you are a person of African ancestry, regardless of whether you're, you're, you hail from the continent or you hail from the diaspora, you are absolutely part of that mathematical equation because as Africans, we were interchangeable. Yeah. Why did people like Ignacio Sancho come over here and still they wanted to enslave him? He was an African from the continent. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? To me, we need to be very careful. So Completely. my definition of activism is somebody who, and I don't want to use the word loyal, I'll say maintains their focus and doesn't get distracted by certain things the enemy will chuck at them. Yeah. And I'm not saying Doreen Lawrence is that. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying embracing and accepting those kinds of honorariums Trinkets, doesn't yeah. accord with me. And I'll give you the best example. In Barbados, apparently, they've dropped the Queen as whatever it is. So the Queen oh, yeah. is no longer the head of state or whatever. Yeah, that's right. But interestingly enough, and I, I picked this up straight away, and I had discussions with, like, you know, some of my, my bridging and sister, in like Brother Hakeem, Sister Sade, some other people. I had these conversations with them, as well as with my family. And what I said to them is, isn't it interesting that the person who read it out was Dame blah, 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 <laughs> from Barbados. Yeah. A dame is a female knight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the first thing to me, if I was her, I would have said, ex diem, mm, because while it. we're dashing out the queen, let's dash out these honorary titles yeah. that so many of us give so much kudos and credence to. I think, I think a lot of this, though, is because it's in response to the mood music, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I mean, yeah. A lot yeah. of the so-called demonstrative acts of um, rejecting the vestiges of colonialism is not necessarily because people have the heart and the spirit behind it. No. 
because the mere music has cued that we should all be doing this. And so yeah, you absolutely. dance to that tune. And that's kind of what it is. Because Do you know, that's a really beautiful way to put it because I'm going to actually teeth that because mm. it really speaks about the difference between structural changes and symbolic changes. Thank you. That's a fair. symbolic change is we're going to get rid of the Queen. The structural aspect is we're still lording ourselves over these towns. I understand. If that, so, so I don't it's really... still be, embedded. I don't really read too much into all, all, all of this stuff. Well, I think you do, because the fact that you can locate it as mood music, it's almost like the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. So yeah, you absolutely yeah, yeah. are yeah, doing for sure. take on it. The fact that you choose to convey it in a way that is palatable is commendable. Mm. That, to me, is what the difference is. Because I think oftentimes people... And this is one of the beautiful things about especially working with Professor Les Back. Because one of the things that he always used to say to me is, you're clever, Les, so you don't have to be overly verbose or tie people up yeah. like what a lot of academics do in, in language or whatever it is. You just say what you've got to say and do what you've got to do. Mm. And the, 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 the profound nature of it will become self-evident. Exactly, exactly. And, I, and, and you know... I 100% recognise, and I would completely second that, like, in terms of the way that you, um, in terms of the way that you actually convey a lot of the um, ideas, a lot of the um, uh, positions that you hold, what you do, um, Prof, is that you allow lay people like myself access to these conversations. Well, I don't know if you're a lay person, but I'll take it. Because I used to be a lay person when I was a DJ and I think I was cleverer than I am now before I got all this <laughs> mind polluted stuff in my head. But the point, the, the, the point... No, I'm, I know exactly what you mean. I the, know what you mean. Yeah, and, 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 and there are very few and far between who don't necessarily um, see their titles um, or the recognition that the system gives them um, as the be all end all. And you said something on your interview that you did. I think it was that, um, was it 40 years on? Um, from the new Possibly, because you know me, one, I never listen to what I've done. I, don't I know, know, yeah, you said, you said. But there, was something, there was something that you said, and I actually feel that that kind of feeds into your definition of activism, which you didn't mention. Hmm. But you said that there's a reason why needed to um, acquire the um, recognition. A PhD. Yeah. And, and as a tool. Are you talking about when exactly, I said it's a tool? Exactly. Yeah. And I and, and 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 to me, the way I see it, that is very much part and parcel of this activism work. Because yeah. I see that there's there there is a terra firma level to these things and then there's a sub zero um, do you get what I mean? There's a sub yeah, there's, absolutely there's yeah. an we'll underground level. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. for me, I feel as though that's still part and parcel of it is that you recognise and you are very much sensitive to the environment around you. But like you said, you don't get distracted by it because without that sensitivity, without having that antenna to really read into what's going on, how can you actually position any form of activism? Well, you know, it's interesting because that's that Audrey Lord thing, isn't it? The keys to the master's house. Thing okay yeah yes exactly that's what it is and to me that's exactly. what it's at all yeah and and i it's interesting because i was invited on a a discussion the other day and what annoyed there's a couple of things that annoyed me you know mm. the first was i didn't agree to do a keynote i thought we were just going to reason yeah i didn't know exactly. it was going to be so you know i left after three hours because i just to me, you cannot have a platform with 100 people and you don't get them to contribute. Mm. You, it just doesn't work like that for me. Yeah. When we used to do Black Fridays at New Beyond from 2006, Black Liberation African Knowledge Fridays, if I knew you, I would have got you to come and do a talk to the community. You would have spoken for about an hour, hour and a half, and it was supposed to start at 7.30 and end at 9.30. Yeah. Sometimes we were there till one o'clock. Yeah. Because the most important aspect is not what you're delivering. It's the reasoning that comes out of it. Thank you. Which is why I'm really not into these kind of things where I come on and I do, a, you know, that's an academic forum. 
How come when I do 20 minutes, no one else does? I ain't got no time for it. The time is still dread. Exactly. So to me, you know, I know the PhD and, and how I always frame it is, or the metaphor, whatever you want to call it, I use, is it's a tool. It is, no important, it. it is no more important to me than learning to use a screwdriver, a spanner or a drill properly when I was a plumber. Because when I was a plumber, if a new drill came out and I thought, let's just make your job easier, I used to buy it. Yeah. If a new pipe cutter came out, I would buy it. The point I'm making is, if you say to me, Les, there's this resource over there, I will go and I will investigate it. And if it works for me, I'll incorporate it. Because it's tools. Yeah. And these, it's, it's interesting because I was talking to one of my students about her son and she said you know her son doesn't see the point in studying at college mm. things that he'll never use and I said because he doesn't understand it's a tool it's exactly. a tool that you may need to open a particular door I would even say it's a tool that we all need I, I, I don't even we need them absolutely think, yeah I don't no. think it's a matter of maybe we definitely need them because this world that we exist in um, demands that of us. Yeah. You, you, you cannot actively participate um, as, a, as a citizen. You cannot actively participate as an actor. You cannot actively participate um, in, in any way, shape or form without acquiring the necessary tool sets to, Absolutely. Uh, to qualify even. Because I say it, it allows you to qualify. It qualifies you to be part of. Of course, of course, of course. So, um, yeah, the, but what you said, um, Prof, about um, the word activism, you made reference to um, uh, Gramsci, and I thought, but in that sense, would that not be more reason to, if anything, cleave to the concept of activism? in order to actually undo um, what is the um, hegemonic intention to frame Absolutely. it. Absolutely. To frame it as something pejorative, to frame it as something negative. Because for me, activism, mm. activism needs to be reclaimed. Because until it's reclaimed, our people will not actually see the value in it. They will yeah. see it through that lens that you describe it as, um, yeah. as, as this negative thing. Whereas activism ought to be part of our everyday lives, and to some degree is anyway. Absolutely. So if you think Absolutely. about um, from an existential yeah. point of view, you, in order to actually um, survive, there's a level of personal activism that is involved. But what we're talking about is social activism. You know, call it black activism, whatever you want. But in 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 in, the, in that sense, we need to be able to reclaim that notion. In the same way that they reclaim the notions of um, uh, black power. Yeah, and even being black. Exactly. And yeah. black in its, so, so it's about reclaiming it. And the reason, I don't know if I told you this before, about why we called ourselves a black knowledge society, we could have very easily gone down the whole highfalutin route of, oh, you know, Al Kabulan or um, uh, yeah. African. Yeah. But the yeah. fact is... We need critical mass, um, whether you like it or not. As a community, if we really want to get someone, we need critical mass. And you can't do that by speaking a foreign language. A lot of people do not resonate. And in fact, I would go as far as to say that a lot of people are anti-African um, within the black community. Of course they are. Of course they are. Exactly. So we're, we're rather than try and position ourselves in a language that the, the black masses don't understand, I think it's very important to use the, the language of the day, you know, to use the lexicon, to use the um, uh, the parlance that people get, you know, because yeah. we're, we're in a different time. Um, but do you know something? It's really interesting you say that because, you know, and there is there was a debate that I had with Brother Toyin Agbetu, who, you know, me and him get on, I like him. I have a lot of love for certain aspects of him, but certain things, you know, fine, we're human beings. However, yeah. one of the big com conversations we used to have was over the usage of the word black so okay. what I basically said to him and and I've written about this and I've said it more times than I can remember mm. yeah. why I called it Black Friday Black Liberation African Knowledge Friday is because I th and it's B-L-A-K and yeah, UK no, Black no. which came out of the UK Karen Wheeler's album 
And it came out of the conversations we were having at grassroots and community level that, yes, we're black, but we are not Asian black in the context of the UK. Now, That's if we're in the Caribbean, that, that conversation doesn't wash. Mm. It doesn't wash in Trinidad, doesn't wash in Suriname, yeah. Guyana, or, play, or Tobago. It doesn't wash. Because, or even in parts of Jamaica, like this place called Cup Brown Pen, where a lot okay. of Indians come from. Yeah. But they're black. Mm. So, you know, that conversation it's is... It's contextual. It's yeah. contextual. But yeah. the point that I'm making is... And I wrote a piece, if I find it, I'll send it to you. I wrote a piece that was in okay. the nation because I think Toyin wrote something about black and I wrote kind of like locating myself and actually said, this is the last time I'm discussing the word black. And that was about 2006 okay. or 2007. I have a few times since. Mm. But what I said to them is, I said to them, I said to Toyin, with respect, you are Igbo. You know you're Igbo. You come from the continent. So there's no problem in you tracing your lineage back. That's like my, right. my mentor, peace be upon him, Professor Herbert Ekwe Ekwe, never called himself a Nigerian. Because mm -hmm. how old is Nigerian and how old is Igbo? Mm, it's true. So you can locate yourself back to the continent. Yeah. My brother Paul Abina can do that. Mm -hmm. He's half white English, half black Nigerian. Yeah. He can root himself back hundreds of years on his father's side. Yeah. I can't do that. Yeah, that's so true. You know, right that's now, so my wife is doing her family tree and mm. stuff like that. And she can go back 150 years. Is that all we are? Mm. So what I used to say to people was, I said, the reason why I use black, and in fact, I said it on that discussion, so you heard me, I will never have an African family gathering only ever. Because I don't know what that means. I do not know, no, I do not know what that means. I have an idea of what certain Pan-Africanists in big quotation marks think. Yeah. But this is what I said to them. I said to them, listen, if I go to Jamaica and I go up country to Clarendon, where my people come from, and I say to them, I'm having an African rally just down the road, 70% of my family from Clarendon ain't coming. <laughs> These are more African than probably a lot of the Africans who are in the UK. Yeah. Because a lot of the people in places like Clarendon, yeah, they may have mixed with Bakra, as in the white man, 150 mm -hmm. years ago, but they do not mix with white people up there now because there ain't no white people up there. Yeah. You might have red people, brown people, whatever, but white people? I've never seen a white person other than my Aunt Shirley, peace be upon her, who used to come up to Clarendon, my uncle's wife and yeah. peace be upon him. Other than that, you don't see white people up there. But if you say to them, there's an African gathering, they ain't coming. If you say there's a black gathering, they'll all come. Yeah. So what I always say is, and I totally, you know, and I totally get, and I just give thanks. And that's probably one of the reasons why I work with you all, because I get that. Mm -hmm. We need to recognize something that associates us with the commonality Exactly. Because as Malcolm X said, they don't hang you because you're Muslim, they don't hang you because you're Christian, they hang you because you're black. Black, that's right. And you can say they don't care. I remember Af Malcolm X was, was one of the people who used to make sure people knew the difference between being an African-American and an African in America. Mm. Because they're not the same thing. And it was Prof Shuja who introduced me to that yeah. years ago when I met him in yeah. 1996. And he said to me, Brother Les, you need to know the difference between an African-American and an African in America. in America. Because we can always be black as a black consciousness. That's right. But we know that there are people, as, as you say, they will take it on symbolically. I know yes. so many people who, you know, Sister Esther um, Stanford Jose calls them Holocaust pimps. Mm. And there are loads of them. They pimp us out. They're black. They're the most radically black. No, I don't want to be black. I'm African. I'm African centered. You know, um, if you if you put a cat in an oven, is it a loaf of bread? Or these stupid analogies that mm. they use, or metaphors, or whatever they are. <laughs> and I said to them, "Listen, that's an idiot way of looking at life to me." You know, because at the end of the day, why is it that Europeans have no issue? in locating themselves as Europeans wherever they are on this damn planet. Mm. 
Right. They will be white as a given. Yeah. And European to frame them in a in a regional. Yeah. All right. We know it's West as a geo geopolitical construct mm. context, but black people. No, they don't want to be African. But I understand why that is, because of that history. That's because so if all you've ever got is this pejorative notion of civilising the savages. Someone sent me something the other day, and it was, you know, a pretty barbaric thing from Africa, somewhere on the continent. I don't know which country it was. Okay. And it was almost like, yeah, man, you see all them steer. And I'm like, send back, and I said... I could bloody show you worse than that in Jamaica if you want me to. Mm. Because what you're, is you're, you're, what you're doing is you're pathologizing us, you're homogenizing us exactly. into this barbaric, uncivilized other, which is one of the reasons why, you know, and again, I'll mention that the MA that we're doing, in it, we are not going to use slavery. We're going to use African chattel enslavement. Because that makes you think about a process that Thank was you. done to people who look like us because we look like us, because yeah. of the skin we're in. It's got nothing to do with them thinking we were savages who needed to be civilised. Read um, Walter Rodney, How You're Underdeveloped Africa. He levels out the greatest argument you'll ever get against the notion that Europeans enslaved us for racial reasons. We know, The racism came later. Yeah, that's right. It was totally economic. Completely. Totally yeah. economic. It wasn't, you, you know, even if you said you're looking at slavery historically, let's just talk about unfreedom as, as enslavement. It is always to do with resources, either your labour power or your land. And the greatest resource that, that humans have ever fought over maybe it's changing now because of the kind of world we're in, are women. Mm. Because before all this stuff that we've got now, the only way you could produce a human being was the mixture of eggs and sperm. Yeah. I don't know what it is now, because I mean, there's, they're, they're doing some Clark Kent, Superman, Sun, Ting, where they're, they're going to try and use... Prof. There's a lot going on. Whatever it is, to create some yeah. type of human being. Whereas to me, you have to have an essential male and female principle, regardless of what process yeah. you go through. Scary, scary stuff going on at the moment. And so for me, you know, when we think about it, we just need to think, what are the best ways for us to unify our people to get us around the table? Yes. So we can have the kinds of conversations we need to ensure that we will be here in 100, 200, 300, 1,000 years. Oh. We need to have those conversations. Oh. And it's not about reductionist racism. You know, like, and you know I hate all these melanin arguments. I, someone I sent really something said. to me the other day and it really hacked me off. And I sent back and I said to them, oh, so you might as well go and read something like Hitler's Mein Kampf for saying, because you're just... In, or the Ku Klux Klan's Klan, and you're just investing in these notions yeah. of human worth based on, yeah. you know, pigmentation. That's so to true. me, we're African members of the human. We're African members of the. We're members of the human family. We belong to the African branch. Yeah. Primarily. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. I ain't superior to anyone. I certainly exactly. ain't inferior yeah. to anyone, because of how I've been born. Yeah. So that means whoever creates what creates differences based on whatever it is you know it's one of the things what i said to people and i said this to this person the other day in jamaica we've got a saying called redibo we call light-skinned people redibo do you know what it actually means no red ebo oh, because really? loads of the ebo people are naturally lighter complexioned yeah. than other people in that region does that mean that they were mixing with white people? Well, you tell me when that happens. Or why is it that loads of the so-called coin, or no, coin coin people, yeah. Nelson Mandela came from, why are loads of them lighter complexion? It's yeah. environmental and all this. And we know across the continent of Africa, you've got every form of human variation on the bloody planet, on that yeah. continent. Yeah. So why invest in these notions of 
melanin rich and melanin poor are blackening and browning and all this yeah. kind of yeah. yeah it is that 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 in itself is a worry um that kind of line of thought or argument to say yeah. um you know we as a people um are in are superior you know I, i'm not really interested in any of that quite honestly you said a lot there and i wanted to actually um unpack a bit more of that but i can't because of time but yeah but that's cool yeah to, like to what extent would you say has your life so far been guided by your sense of um activism in the context of what i mean as activism or what you you defined about to me from i'll be honest with you from when i was 15 mm. i always say 15 but i was conscientized before that I would say probably from about the age of 11, when I started to reason with, we knew him then as Russ Cosmo. They call him Elder Herakuti, who's on Galaxy Radio. And he, and I say this all the time, but if you want to know who this personage is, watch the film Babylon. I think it came out about 79 or something. You see this Rasta man walking down the road, all robed up. His beard, I think, is wrapped around his chin a few times. And in my chant on Babylon, that is Russ Cosmo. That is Elder Herakuti. So those times there, if that's 1979, mm. I've already been reasoning with him for more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. We met him. He used to live in, the, in the, the basement of a house in Forest Hill that we knew the family. So I, I think it was him and his wife, Francis, and, you know, peace be upon her, she's transitioned as well. Okay. They used to live in our house. And all we remember is our friends used to say, yeah, we have one Rasta man we live downstairs, you know, because there weren't a lot of Rastas around them time then. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking late 60s. Okay. And we used to go and reason with him. And he used to just tell us these, you know, a proper storyteller, mm. but who can locate you in it. So he was telling us all these wonderful things about, African people and what Rastafari is and his majesty and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So I kind of got conscientized from then. But the consolidation came at, when I was 15, when I went to Moonshot Youth Club, and I've mentioned it so many times, because that's when I started to understand the practical application of black activism. So it's, it was a youth club. It was a learning space. We learned black history. We learned self-defense through Shota Khan Karate. We learned about why we became other to Europe's self. We became why. We, we, we got to learn why, as Africans, we're totally interchangeable. White racists didn't care whether you spoke with a, with a Nigerian accent or a Trinidadian accent. You were going to get the same treatment. So we actively fought against that. So my activism is central to everything I do. Mm. Because if it doesn't have, look, if it doesn't have some kind of resonance with, with people who look like me and people who perhaps want to, I don't know, work with people who look like me for the treatment that I get for the skin I'm in, I'm not interested in it. No. I'm not into superficial stuff. I'm not into symbolic stuff. I am into things that will cre create and perpetuate critical, systemic, structural, institutionalized change. Otherwise, I'm not interested in it. And, you know, wherever I've been as an academic, I've ruffled loads of feathers because people want me to be involved in certain projects. And I'll say to them, what is going to actually be the end product? I want to know what the end is going to be. Mm. That's what I want to... Is that a teleological view? I think it is when you need to know what the end is. If, you, if I can't see the end, I'm not interested. Mm. And I'm not talking about, you know, this kind of narrow or myopic take. I'm talking about, for instance, when myself, um, Sister Anne-Marie, Brother Adate Mohammed. Sister Francesca Mohammed, when we all got together and created something called, and it was a Nation of Islam initiative, when we got together and we created um, the NIEC, National Independent Education Coalition, 
We planned it, I think it was from 2004 to 2006. And in 2006, we launched it for a series of events. We created an online resource, which it's more for them than me, but they linked up with a school in America. So there was like a virtual classroom that ideas would be in exchange. We're talking 2006. Mm. Now, the only reason why I stayed was because from the outset, we agreed between us, we're going to do this, this, and this by 2006. So we sought funding, we got funding, and we did it. We did exactly what we said we were going to do. Then for me, I can move on because things should take on their own dynamic. Mm -hmm. So if your activism is pragmatic in that sense, you can see what you're going to achieve Even if it's incremental achievements, like it might be this year we'll do this, next year we'll do that. But you must be able to see what you're going to do. Otherwise, you will be infiltrated and undermined by people who maybe they're active in their own way. So, for instance, throughout the years we were were planning that, we had loads of people who came in. Yeah, I've heard about your initiative, I'd love to do it. And then when they came in, they were like, oh, why don't we deal with this? And we're like, well, no, this is the agenda. This is the timeline. This is what we're going to achieve. Chuck, you see or no? Blah, blah. And we're like, okay, <laughs> later on. And they just went. Yeah, yeah. Because at the end of the day, you have to, your, your, your activism has to be coupled with commitment. But as, and I know Malcolm X said it, I'm not sure who said it before him, where there is no vision, people perish. perish yeah, you yeah. must have a vision. That's well, what you can is. call it a dream. You know, and one of the things what I always say is, you know, what is a dream of and what is a dream if not a blueprint for courageous action? And it actually comes out of a Batman film where he was chatting up <laughs> Catwoman and she told him you're a dreamer. It comes out of the Batman movie from 1966. <laughs> Ask me why I remembered that line as a big man and I had to start using it. It always stuck with me. Yeah. <laughs> but it comes from that film. He's chatting up Catwoman and she says, I'll never go on a date with you, not in your wildest dreams. And he goes, well, what is a dream if not a blueprint for courageous action? Yeah. And yeah. I've always embraced that. It because to me, one. that's what it is. Yeah. Absolutely. It is so profound. Yeah. And it also speaks to some of the places where our activism has the most clout because it might be in a popular cultural arena. And the flip side of that is some of the the so-called Small Axe series that for me was, it's almost as bad as the Tony Saul report in the context of setting us back. Oh, wow. I'm totally, the one on Leroy Logan for me was okay. But the one on Lover's Rock to me was dastardly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Because there was no love in it. Yeah, uh, for me, I cannot necessarily relate um, just because it's a time, it's an experience um, that that I don't even have any secondary um, knowledge or uh, understanding on. But yeah, I mean, I can only um, take your your account. So so you you think it was a back step? Listen, my children who... Mm. The youngest one is 27. The ne- the one next to her is 30. And then my oldest son is 47 this year. Mm. And all of them who watched it thought, what the hell was that? Because okay. they grew up with Lover's Rock. Yeah. And they've done, like my last two daughters, they were part of a, a project that we did on called True Reggae Story. And they interviewed, they interviewed producers, they interviewed singers, DJs, whatever. Mm. So they met people like Sister Audrey, one of the primary Lovers Rock stroke yeah. roots and culture singers from that time. They met Peter Huntingale, you know, people like Tipper Irie, Maccabee, Papa Levi. Yeah, yeah. They met all of those yeah. people. So they know mm. what Lovers Rock was about. That it was Because what I said to people is about that program and why for me it was dastardly and disparaging is the fact that there was the first thing that you you picked up on the girl whose party it was 17 Chevex why why was she so angry yeah 
And then there were all these kind of things like these conflations. You would never, as a 17-year-old, have a blues dance. It's impossible. Blues dance, you sell alcohol, then smoke weed and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But a birthday party, no way. It just, it just, and then you got so-called rasters stripping off and and rolling around on the floor like they're possessed by some kind of demons or something. (laughs) Let me tell you something. Sis, Esther, if that happened in a dance, why not throw them through the window for cool off? They would just open the window and throw them outside and hopefully they're on the first floor so they could roll to the grass. <laughs> you know, these things just wouldn't happen. It just yeah. weren't playing one record for 12 <laughs> minutes and people singing it a cappella for nine. But that's not, but 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 obviously that is creative license, right? That is stylization for the purpose of it's a creative a- license, but when you don't, you, I'll tell you what the real problem is here. And I used to say this years ago, okay. As Africans, we don't have balance in the wider yeah. public arena. We don't. We do not have balance. Not. Definitely not. Now, if we had balance, we would say, yeah, the Lover's Rock thing is fine, but you can flip a channel and watch Menelik Shabazz, the Lover's Rock mm. story. Mm. But you don't get balance. You can't. No, that's because right. When I, used to, when I used to have these conversations when I was an undergraduate and we were talking about media, so we're talking in the 90s, and they used to say, yeah, well, you know, we've got white programs like that. And I said, yeah, but you flip the channel and you'll see a positive representation yeah. of yourselves. That's we right. don't. And that's why one, one thing what people used to say is, oh, well, we just give thanks. We've got black people on the telly. I hate and that's that. when I started saying no representation is better yeah, than this representation. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's I like know. comparing the Bible to the Holy Quran. Mm. The Bible, you've got all these images that brainwash you into not believing that you are anything to look like your creator. Yeah. The Quran, images are graven, they're not in there. So at least with the Holy Quran, you could you can you can manifest the divine. In your own in image. Mind's eye. That's what I say to people. Yeah. I, I've said it for years. I said, if Les was ever going to embrace an orthodox religious belief system, it would 100% be Islam. No. Just for the fact that there are no images in there. So I can actually think about God manifested in something that looked like Les. Yeah. When you read these Bibles and things like that, they're, yeah, oh, mate, I don't even want, but it's the representation. Sure. If we had balance, so we've got Steve McQueen, and don't get me wrong, he's a wonderful filmmaker. His stuff is artistically beautiful, you know. But, but again, I wasn't too moved by 12 Years a Slave. But as you said, it's got the artistic license. But what happens is the people it's created for, the white middle classes, because that's who these programs are created for, yeah. they don't see artistic license. Exactly. They see representation, yeah, accurate representation Absolutely. that Absolutely. is misrepresentative of what we bring to the table and, and and that's a very very fair um point you know because i think it is it's 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 misdirection it's, it's misdirection, like but, magic but, but, but smoke and mirrors exactly but then prof, even at that what you're saying about um steve mcqueen being brilliant and whatever why is it you know if we want to take the whole um argument of balance further yeah. Um, to the point of um, the um, directors, why does it always seem to be Steve McQueen that is acceptable to the Academy? Right? Because he's he's your what did you call it? He's the mood the mood music. Thank you, exactly. And that's what I'm saying. Like for me, I don't know him, but what I do know of him is that he seems to be ubiquitous. I don't really see a lot of other black directors. Um, that are uh, he is he is ubiquitous because he, he's everywhere and he will be called on for every single thing exactly because he is somebody that you know from my point of view and I, like I said I don't know him he seems to play to audience give them what they want he's the um, crowd pleaser within his own sort of creative realm um, and he likes it that way that's my impression but I don't know him you know so I don't want to sort well of th- because to be honest we can only read we can only read into it what we basically observe. Yeah. Exactly. And he's a Thank safe you. pair of hands. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He's a safe pair of hands. Absolutely. Because the thing is, if you talk about, if you talk about the process of racialization, we know that there are elements of compromise. We know that. 
100%. We also know, and, and that's why I love Malcolm X, you know, and I used to start some of my talks with it, where Malcolm X, I think it was Message to the Grassroots, where he said something like, you know, good evening, friends, comrades, associates, and enemies. And then he went quiet and people went like sharp intake of breath. And he goes, we'd basically be fools if we didn't think there were some enemies. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not saying he's an enemy. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that... By your fruit. But he's Sir Steve McQueen. <laughs> it says it all. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yet another... You know, so for me, uh, you know, as I said, you know, good luck to him. But what I'm basically saying is I do not want to be measured by the standards that the likes of him put out there Project, yeah, to sure. that middle class dominant mass. Because although they're a minority, they are the majority when it comes to dominance yep. in the context of what is screened, who screens it, blah, 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 who funds it, exactly. who gets the accolades. And yeah. we know it is middle class England, middle England. Imagine we've got the most overtly anti-black prime minister openly, I'm not saying he's worse than Blair, I'm just saying we've got the most open one mm -hmm. and look at the votes, what they got the other day. People were saying exactly. to me, oh yeah, Boris is going to get a slap in his face. And I said to people, you know what? I ain't really into the politics business, you know, but I'm not a fool. Mm -hmm. I said, listen, they're going to smash this Labour man, whoever it is, because he's got the name Sir and it doesn't accord with ordinary working class people. Yeah. They don't want to be led by Sir anyone because straight away it's like what we're if we were speaking in the context of class and not race, mm. many of the discussions we've had already, you know, they will fit comfortably. Same, yeah, exactly. Because loads of the white working class people who I know, there is no what they would vote, they voted against Labour just because of him. Mm. How can a Sir represent us? Absolutely, for sure. And, and that's what it is. So I'm I'm basically saying yes. You know, living in the world we've inherited, there are certain levels of compromise. But as I said, and I've always, I, I strive for balance. Yeah. So to me, we could have a thousand Steve McQueens putting out a thousand films every week. If we had a thousand who didn't think like that, putting mm -hmm. out films every week, films, programs, music, whatever it is, so that you get a balance. Because what you see, it's even like when we talk about decolonizing whatever it is, these people are not afraid of decolonization per se. They are afraid of the fact that people will get balance and they will see them for what they are. Of course, of course. Historical liars, reductionists. I've seen some of these so-called historians on TV and I'm not a historian mm. and I'm thinking, Jesus, peace, man, I could go out there and demolish them yeah. with the stuff that they're just leading, leaving out of these stories. Yeah. So, you know what, at the end of the day, as I said, you know, those of us whose minds are intact, and I will just say this, are intact, and we still got, I don't know, some kind of flavour going through it, then... We just need to do what we do because we're in a great moment now. Yeah. You know, we can, things like this create balance. Yeah. That's what they do. You know, you do your, your little bit. I do my little bit. And what we do is we strive for balance because mm. what people don't, it's like one of the things I've really noticed since I, I returned to education mm. is how important Rastafari was in the context that Rastas taught me how to reason. Mm -hmm. I can't speak for some of the people who call themselves Rust nowadays, but I know the Rastas who I used to reason with when I was a, when I was young, whether they were younger than me or older than me, it was always about reasoning. Mm -hmm. Esther, you could have the biggest, dirtiest argument, but what a cost, mm -hmm. everything I fly. But at the end... You say, uh, yeah, you know what? There's some value in what you're just saying. Oh. Yeah. It has value. So guess what? I'm going to meditate on that mm. and we will talk again. Yeah. That's Rastafari. Yeah. I never got that in university. Mm. 
That's why me and my 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 best friend, who I call my little brother Delwyn, when we were undergraduates, we made a film called Reason versus Reasoning. Okay. In 1996 to 97, when we were undergraduates, we made a film as part of our anthropology module. And basically what we did was we compared Rastafari reasoning, reasoning. to what happens in parliament. And we interviewed people like Maccabee, Sister mm. Audrey, and people like that, because mm. they're both Rastafari. And what we did was we, we compared and contrasted what they saw as reasoning against what was happening in politics, in parliament. Mm -hmm. I remember we had a clip where this was before parliament was necessarily massively filmed, but we found a clip where some dude was talking in parliament and the other man boxing around the back of him head. He does, yeah. You would never see that in a Rasta circle, uh, you know, or no, ground you, Asian. You You'd never see it. Of, that that would never happen. That reminds me of almost the equivalent of the Enlightenment and Enlightenment. Um, absolutely, the absolutely. They're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. They're, They're not, not the same, same thing. thing. And I don't want to give away the title to my professorial lecture. Mm. But it's a Rastafari take on Durkheim's, you know, I think, therefore I am. I am, yeah, yeah. Because That's it's, like... I remember when I first met Paul Gilroy and he just dropped that lecture on the Enlightenment and induced, introduced us to Descartes and, you know, the architectural metaphors and all this wonderful stuff. Yeah. And I was walking with Paul and I remember it was the, the first proper conversation I had with Paul Gilroy and it was myself, Derwin and Paul and we were walking back from the lecture theatre and I said to him, I said to him, I said, um, Paul, if Descartes was Russ, it would be more encompassing because it would be I and I think, therefore I and I am. <laughs> and I and I is me and God yeah. and me and the community. Yeah. It's Ubuntu. Ubuntu. I am because we are, because we are, therefore I am. Yeah. I am we, we am I. Not. I think, therefore I am. Because yeah. that's the separation between mind and body. That's the Cartesian dualism. Yeah. You don't get that in Rasta. Mm. And I remember when I said it to Paul, he laughed I and he goes, Paul. yeah, you're spot on. He goes, you're bang on the money. And I know that's one of the things that endeared me to him mm. because we've had those conversations because it's divergent thinking. And why can you not bring what you represent to the table? Yeah. This is going to be central to the ontological, if I want to use that word, take yeah. on the masters we're going to do. Mm. People who do that masters are going to be able to bring whatever they can in a reflexive way to the table. Because to me, you cannot do a masters on in black anything to do with black studies, and you can't put yourself in the first person Absolutely. in it. Absolutely. Whether you're black, white, African, European, or whatever. Because yeah. I know for a fact that if this course runs and we do a global version of it, we will get brothers and sisters from Australia, mm. First Nation peoples from the Americas, you name it, we'll get them. Because remember that uh, brothers and sisters that who don't mind calling themselves Aborigines, because I did a, a discussion with them last year, they firmly locate themselves in black liberatory struggles, 100%. Okay. That's why if you look at them, you'll see sometimes they'll have they'll have um, the ANC flag, they'll have the okay. flag of Ghana, they'll have whatever it is, you know, the black star, yeah, the yeah, red, yeah. black and green, mm. red, gold and green. Okay. And a good friend of mine, Ishmael Blagrove, who does Rice and Peace films, there's a there's a there's a documentary on his site called It's Our Country Too. Watch that film. Okay. Because he went to Australia and he did this this revelation of a film called It's Our Country Too. And if you watch it, you will be shocked at those people. There's a really interesting bit in there when Ishmael is speaking to like one of these white Australians who, for me, is a closet racist. And basically the way he's talking about the Aboriginals is exactly the same way as how they would speak about us as Africans. Mm. So dehumanize us. Yeah. And Ishmael, because Ishmael is Ishmael, and Ishmael is just, I know, I heard of Ishmael from when he was about 17, 15, and he always does the soapbox in Hyde Park Corner. He's been doing okay. it for probably over 30, I don't even know how old Ishmael is. 
Mm. But I heard about this you who used to be on a soapbox in Hyde Park Corner who mm. came from West London. And it was him. So I heard about him years before I met him. And what Ishmael says to this white Australian person is, oh, well, you could be talking about me as a black person. Yeah. Because they don't locate it. It's yeah. like, oh, you're all right. I don't know about yeah. the others. Yeah. And to me, it also goes back to what we discussed from the outset. Certain people can be accepted into certain spaces and places. Yeah. Why well, have we got Kemi Badenoch denying white privilege, institutional yeah. systemic racism? Says if you teach critical race theory, which comes out of critical legal theory, mm. I don't know if she even knows that, yeah? You're committing a crime, yet, unless they've changed it, no one who looks like her is in the senior cabinet, but she denies systemic racism. I just, uh, yeah. It's a nutcase. It's just like the Sewell report. You know, if you know, it's like, I've, I've said this loads of times and I'll say it because I know we're closing soon. Mm, but well, to me, do yeah. not call these people <laughs> sellouts because they're not sellouts. To sell out, you have to buy in. Yes, you did say that. If you heard me turn around and say, do you know what, Sis Esther? I don't believe in this institutionalized racism or systemic racism. It doesn't exist. We're all the same. Pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Les would be the biggest rotted Uncle Tom, Uncle Jim, Uncle Bill sellout you could ever meet. Because I've always bought into this. Yeah. And it's not a conscious buy-in. It's just I've had to buy in because I can see what is the reality for people who look like me. Right. So because we're closing soon, let me yeah. get... <laughs> So um, in terms of, well, from your understanding, how important or how central do you feel that activism is to this nation building um, exercise that we're, we're attempting to do? For me, activism is central. If we're talking about activism as the product of people who can see what is actually happening, people who don't necessarily get confused by the smokes and mirrors, the symbolic, the symbolic, I don't know, gestures that are supposed to appease us. So to me, if you've got people who are activists in that sense, i.e. they see something and they may not have the solution, but they can see it. Therefore, they can articulate it and they can work with others who are like-minded to deal with those concerns, those immediate concerns. To me, that's what activism is. So an activist will be able to, I don't know, create a template, have a blueprint. You may not have all the answers. Mm. You know, one of the things what Marcus Garvey said was Marcus Garvey basically said, you know, let's say there's something you want to achieve, okay? And you've mapped the steps to achieve it. So you said, I need to do this, this, and this to achieve that. However, when you do this, this happens and throws you over there and you realign and you bring yourself back and you're back on track. And then something else happens and you get distracted and you realign, but you achieve the goal. Marcus Garvey said, use that as an aspect of your methodology. That for me is what activism is. That's what Garvey suggested over a hundred years ago or a hundred years ago. That's what Garvey said. Because what that actually means is, let's say you've seen something and you want to be actively against it, because that's what activism is for me, in a nutshell. Now, you've seen it and you're thinking, right, this is, this is the conundrum, this is the problem, this is what I need to solve. These are the steps I'm going to take to solve it. But as you go past this step, you hit a barrier. For me, what you do then, and this speaks to the difference between leadership and leaders, okay? Because you may well lead that project. However, when you hit this barrier, let's say in the context of Les, it's something to do with finances. I don't know anything about finances. Mm. Then I might say, do you know what? Sis Charmaine from Black History Studies is always talking about finances. Let me give her a one card, make a reason. So instead of me being the leader and the big ego, now what I'm doing is I'm delegating. 
not only delegating, I'm negotiating, I'm reasoning because I need to get to the end goal. Yeah. That to me is what activism is. Yeah, yeah. That to me is what it is in a nutshell. And I think it's very simple because I'm just not into, you know, oh, it's like when people say to me, oh yeah, Professor Les, you're an expert in that. I'm not an expert in anything. I have expertise. Mm. Because to me, if you're an expert, then that's it. It's the best it can be. You mm. cannot improve it. If you have expertise, you can always improve. Yeah, for sure. You said and that speaks to my life as a martial artist, as a plumber, as an industrial pipe fitter, as a DJ, as a lecturer. Mm. I have expertise in those things. Just now, when you were talking about uh, with, with the Black Nation Building Agenda, you, you said um, basically when you're looking actively um, against something and trying to put it right. Yeah. Could the same be said in reverse? So, you know what you say about um, transcendentalism? Yeah. Oh, yeah. To be transcendental. What you say about that to me is rather than it being actively against. Yeah. No. Yeah. Like, absolutely. And thanks for the correction. You're absolutely right. Because you know I'm just not into resistance or countering or challenging. Exactly. It's exactly. overcoming, exactly. transcending. So, yeah, but but you see, for me, the transcendental nature is when you achieve the end goal. Because the end goal, the resistant part will be as you're going through the stages. But the consolidation okay. Okay. will happen towards the end when you transcend that. So okay. it'll be, it's a bit like... Um, you know, 30 years ago, if we were having a conversation about peoples of African ancestry, like what I said about a lot of my family in Jamaica, yeah. denying that they're African, mm. okay? Denying that they're African and, you know, they're in Jamaica, they're in Clarendon or wherever my people come from, and they're denying the fact that they're African because the only people they see are Jamaicans. Yeah. Then I invite them to the UK, and this has happened on loads of occasions, Okay. I invite them to the UK and I do little tests on them. Yeah? yeah. So one of my cousins who I love, I love her more than anyone. She's the closest of my family in Jamaica. Okay. Yeah. Met her when she was 15, you know, and I've, she's always been like my, my little sister stroke cousin. Okay. Yeah. And she came here with her family last year, I think it was. Okay. Just before lockdown. Mm. And over the years, I've kind of made her realise that she is African. Okay. But she's still in her head got these things because of who she's surrounded with. Yeah. And although we've got a lot of rustas in our family, oftentimes people might see them as head cases or nutters or them smart to much weed and ton fool or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, we went down to one of the major supermarkets, superstores near where I live in Charlton, yeah? Yeah. And... I said to her, oh, look at those people up there. I said, look at those two sisters. And she said, yeah, you said the Jamaican them everywhere. And I went, well, actually, they're not. They're Nigerians. And she was shocked. Yeah. Do you understand me? Yeah. That's what we can do now that mm. we never used to be able to do before. So if we're talking about the kind of qualitative changes that we can make, those are easy ways to figure it. Yeah, for sure. You know, because if you're in Jamaica and you see, you'll see African-Americans who look like you. You'll see Africans on the continent who look like you. You'll see Africans in Brazil who look like you. But because of the, the because of the programming. Yes. You do not see them as African. Yeah. As you do not see yourself as African. You see yourself as Jamaican mm. or black. Mm. So to me, it's how do we affect those qualitative changes? And one of the ways is, you know, we're in a beautiful moment now. I remember the first time I went to Ghana, 90, well, first and only time I've been to Ghana in 1996, I was stopping people in the street and taking pictures of them. They must have thought I was a nutter. Yeah. I was like, do you know, can I take a picture of you? And they're like, why? And I go, because you really look like someone I know in England and I need to show them this image. Yeah. But when I came back from Ghana, there were loads of people who I know who didn't think they were African. Mm. They're the ones who, because you have to see this, sis Esther. When I was Leslie Lyrics DJing on Sound System, and the only difference between what I say now is I used to chat it on Sound System. Now I write it as essays, articles, chapters, books, whatever. Mm -hmm. Before I used to just be lyrics on Sound Systems. 
my sensibilities in Africa have never changed. Mm. But I was just Leslie Lyrics, the nutter, who if they saw me coming down the street, they knew they couldn't say to me, yeah, what well, Les, how are you doing? And I said, boy, I'm a good, you know, and they say, oh, you're good. And I say, how are you doing? Boy, you know, Babylon hard. And I say, why? Now, they don't want that conversation because then we have to start talking about some African ancestry and how yeah. we've been historically placed and located, yeah. structural placement, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so they would avoid that. Yeah. But when I, all, all of a sudden, when I'm studying now, and most of the people who, who I knew, knew I was heading towards a, a doctorate from when I started as an undergraduate. So in 1996, this is Les, come back. And I would see some of these people and I'd go, hey, look at this. And I'd say, Buck said, I'm fear of my family, or she fear of my family. And I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah. You know, I took it in Jamaica and they go, oh, which part of Jamaica? And I'll go like, Accra, yeah, yeah. in Ghana. And that's what I used to do. I used to do it to them. People who people I know who came from Grenada and places like that, I'd say, yeah, it was when I was in Grenville, I took these pictures and they're like, really? And I say, no, it was in, <laughs> in I don't know, Kumasi. Yeah. But they don't see. And nowadays, this, these are the beautiful things that we can do. And especially mm -hmm. through, you know, for me, outlets like yours, like the Black Knowledge Society, let people really understand that, there are games being played with us. Perhaps one billion percent. Like, that is just... There's the games. These politicians like that, Kemi Badenoch and, That's you know, and it. people like Tony Saul and, and what's her name, Pretty Patel and all these people, they're playing games. They're yeah. playing the Masters games. Absolutely. It's divide and rule 101. Absolutely. Because as long as their, bed, their beds are feathered, no, their nests are feathered and their beds are laid... They're fine. They're fine, for sure. They're fine, because they don't have... They're insulated. You know, it's one of the things what I used to say to people, OK? I'm not a millionaire. I've never been a millionaire. But I know people who are millionaires, mm. OK? And those people who are millionaires, Esther, they don't take buses through Lewisham. Mm. They don't take the underground or the train. Sometimes, some of them, I know, they get chauffeured around. So they do not share aspects of our everyday liberty, as Rastafari said. Mm -hmm. So we can't necessarily condemn them and say, you know, you're ignorant or you're whatever it is. So, no, sometimes they are ignorant because they are not in those spaces. Yeah, that's right. Some of the shops that they go into, like the top of the range shops, they may get the odd look. But once they become part of the clientele, they're not getting it anymore. Of Let course. me and you go in there with them and they'll see the qualitative difference. Yeah, for sure. Because they're insulated against many of the things that blight our existence for being born black mm -hmm. or peoples of African ancestry. So I don't really, that's why sometimes when I hear people saying, do you know, I've never really experienced that. And I'm like, well, you wouldn't. Yeah. You know, if you're driving a Rolls Royce, you're going to feel certain bumps in the road. Mm. But if you drive an old jalopy, you're going to bloody feel all of them. Exactly. And to me, that, those are the qualitative differences in experiences. Mm. And I think sometimes, you know, we need to be a bit prudent, take a step back. Before we condemn people, let's reason with them <laughs> and try and understand yeah. why they're oblivious to it. Yeah. However, someone like, you know, that one who's in Parliament, she has no excuses. None. Because her government... Her leader is so overtly and openly racist. You know, he has put his name to public projects before he was going to be elected. Like there was one black project, which, you know, I don't agree with them when they want to create memorials and whatever it is, but he put his name to it. 100% support I will give you. Backside when him get elected. I was at a talk where the sister was, was you know, really kind of conveying her disappointment in him and how... He kind of reneged on his agreement. And I said, Why? a Boris Johnson you deal with, you know, who said, you know, we're flag waving, watermelon smile, picking in his for the Queen and the Commonwealth or whatever. Why do you think he would change? Nah. Yeah. To me, we just gotta we just gotta try and inhabit the real world. And those of us like me who really don't care will say what I need to say to yeah. anyone. Because I just as I said to people, you know, peace be upon my mum, she was the calming influence 
Mm. But since my mum passed, my dad has totally taken over. And him, he, he, he died in the 80s, 85. Yeah. But he's totally taken over. Wow. And my dad had the most indomitable African spirit I've ever met, with Clarendon in it. Yeah, yeah. And this is the other thing what I say to people, you know, people look at me and they might say, oh, you're born in Lewisham, you're an English idiot. No, I'm Clarendon mm. that happened to be born in Lewisham because that's where my parents came from yeah. of my, yeah. you know, my peoples. Yeah, it follows you. I, do, I just, uh, you know, I can't compromise, sis. Yeah. I can't compromise. I'm not afraid of people. I certainly ain't afraid of white people. Mm. And I certainly ain't afraid of white supremacist thought and action. No. Whiteness to me is just systemic and it's something that can definitely be overcome. All systems can be overcome. As a Jamaican youth said to me once in another context, he said to me, if man make it, man can defeat it. Yeah, yeah, 100. And it's always resonated with me. It's just simple truths. I want to get to the next question. Okay, so you kind of touched on this already, but why, why do you think um, activism has received a bad press historically? And I think it goes back to what you said about design yeah. and language and whatnot, but I, I think yeah. that's a very um, useful one if you could. Yeah. Well, for me, the reason why black activism will always get a bad press, because it's proactive. So what it's basically doing is it's seeing the systemic embedded inequalities that are based on, you know, this notion of race that that white supremacist Europeans created four or five hundred years ago, the way it manifests now, let's say. So the reason why people will be afraid of it, for me, and I and I did mention it before, is because you're actively seeking to overthrow an unjust, inhuman, sorry, inhumane system, okay, that privileges people, no, that privileges some white people more than others, because all white people can invest in white supremacy, all of them. All of them can invest in whiteness if they choose to do so, okay. But basically what it is, is about how do you overthrow, revolutionize a system that is inherently racist and as such anti-human, anti the African branch of the human family in this context, and other brothers and sisters from other branches of the human family who are not, I like to use the word, who are non-black. Okay, right. So to me, you know, we are talking about, you recognize the hegemonic system so you want to create something that is anti-hegemonic, anti-racist, anti-whatever. Now, of course, the people who, who, who flourish within that status quo, why would they want to affect change? Right. Why would they want to facilitate conversations that they know are going to threaten and jeopardize the power, the power positions they inhabit? And a good way to think about it, and, I'm, and I always try to think of it was, but I'm sure it was John Locke. If it wasn't John Locke, you can stop rolling in your grave because I'm not saying it was you. But there was one of those European economists, stroke philosophers. I think it was John Locke. I may be wrong. But basically what he said was, they want the most lowly European to have a higher status than any African chief. This is what they said. So it's not coincidental that as Africans, we find ourselves at the lowest strata of all the societies on the damn planet, because we are. It doesn't matter which country we're in. You've seen some of the things from, you know, I'm sure you've seen some of those films from brothers and sisters and parts of the continent where they've got Chinese people coming in and basically treating them like shit in their own countries. Nigeria, case in point. Yeah, we see that. Same thing was happening in, in is happening in parts of Jamaica. Now, I'm not saying the Chinese are inherently bad, but what I'm saying is colonization is colonization, no matter how you dress it up. 
and it's a global, it and it's a global export. Like colonization, of course it is. As a concept, is a global. Um, of concept, course it is. Which means that it is adopted by anyone who feels that they're in a position of power to Absolutely. alert on a group that they feel is beneath them. Absolutely, because that's the only way colonization and imperialism work. Exactly. You have an inferior and you have a superior. Exactly. And, 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 and that's what we're seeing in, in China. And it's because it's been modeled, you know, it's been modeled previously. They've taken from that model and they've. Absolutely, yeah, they've used it to subjugate their, their own peoples. Exactly. Exactly. So they just transplant that model. Because I don't know if you know, but I think it's Singapore or one of those countries. Do you know they are totally owned and controlled by the Chinese? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, you see, because we, you see, one of the distractions is, well, it's very convenient when we say it's for us in Africa or people in the Caribbean or they hate us because we're Africans or whatever. No, mate, it's a model. And mm -hmm. I agree with what you just said. The model is about power. Yeah. The powerful over the powerless. Mm. So apparently the same roads and building schemes that they're using in places like Jamaica, like in Jamaica, they've created this wonderful highway. Whereas before, if I was going to Ocho Rios, I used to have to drive around Fern Gully and all these places. It would take me two hours to get there on a good day. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 40 minutes on the motorway that the Chinese have made. Sis Esther, it's beautiful. You just go up in the mountains and you just go across and it's... What's beautiful. the price, Prof? What's the price? And that's the thing. Yeah. Jamaica will never pay that loan back. No. It's impossible Absolutely. for them to pay that back, which means that the Chinese have got their tendrils Thank into you. Jamaica and Jamaican society. But as I said, I'm sure it's Singapore or one of those places. What the Chinese did was they built the airport, they built this, they built all these structures whatever it is. And then when they said, right, on the Afapia buck, they were like, well, we can't. Well, it's okay. We'll take this. We'll have that. And that's how they control. Yeah. That's what colonialism yeah. is. They model. And they've done that in um, Zambia as well, actually. So some parts of Zambia have already been colonised by the Chinese in exactly the same way. That they've and done they that. will do it globally because they have the technology. They can go in and they can say, right, look, a mountain in China isn't much qualitatively different from a mountain in Jamaica or a mountain in Zaire. Mm. It's not different. So if you're saying, look, we know the best way to get from A to B usually is across the mountain. Yeah. Now, what happens if you can cut through the mountain with mm. a tunnel? Mm. Everything becomes quicker. Yeah. Everything, your infrastructure changes for the better. But the people on the ground... Like loads of people in Jamaica, they can't afford to pay the tolls on the toll road. You know, it might be something like, I can't even remember what it is. It might be like eight US dollars or seven US dollars because, you know, everything in Jamaica is US. They, they're supposedly English ex-colony, but they don't like pounds. Everything is US dollars. Yeah. Now, what I'm basically saying is for me, if I do that trip every day, see, it's a tenner. Five pound there, five pound back. It's nothing. That's people's wages. Exactly. So that's how the colonization works. Yeah. So for me, when we talk about, you know, where people will marshal against black activists, it's because people who can see the world in that way will enlighten people. You imagine if Jamaicans went to the airport and said, you know what, we're striking. We don't want these people in here because we've seen what they've done to other global territories, then there will be changes. Yeah. But to, to you know, it's like Karl Marx, religion is the opiate of the masses. Yeah. Okay. You know, what I always say is knowledge gives us the power to liberate or enslave. Mm. You can use knowledge to liberate or you can use knowledge to enslave. If you know that there are a group of black activists who are basically using the knowledge, the same knowledge that you give them, Mm. to liberate, of course you're going to shut them down. Of course you're going to fight against them. Of course you're going to make out like their their head cases or their terrorists or their, their whatever it is. Of course they're going to do that. But that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Because what you're doing is you're protecting your interests. You think about this, and I, I tweeted this the other day, mm. because for me it was the perfect 
example of how messed up this world is that we live in. So I get news feeds come up on my phone, okay? And I took a screenshot of it. And the top of the news feed it had something like 600 British, 600 jobs are going to be lost in Britain because this company, I can't remember what the company was, is going to shut down this, this, this branch and focus abroad. 600 people are going to lose their incomes and their lifestyles. Yeah. Okay. 600. So people will say, yeah, but you know, there's millions of people unemployed. But for me, this is 600 souls who today were employed, tomorrow they're not going to be. Mm. Right underneath it, it was something like a stamp that was found. I think it was, I don't know, it was, I think it was somewhere in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. A stamp, a postage stamp, yeah. was expected to fetch 15 million US dollars at an auction. So you've got 600 people being made redundant, unemployed, mm. 600 souls. Now add the families. Let's say they got three people in each of their households they depend on. You're talking 2,400 people. Mm. Lives have just been messed up by a decision. And yet, underneath it, you've got a stamp will sell for 15 million. I was thinking that 15 million would help those people out for probably a couple of years. It would more than help them out for a couple of years. But this to but me... This is the world we've inherited. Exactly, exactly. And this is why, to me, it tells me that things can change because that, in my head, just in my mind, I just think... It, it doesn't it, compute. It doesn't compute. It's just... It's, it's so arbitrary how value is placed on things. It is mad. It is to that extent. That well, you see, on one sense, we say it's arbitrary, but really it's deliberate because what they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to value things that have no... It's like the best, the best way to think about it is if I say to you, here's a glass of water and here's a diamond, the diamond is worth 10 million pounds. And there's a glass of water. Honestly, Esther, which one would you take? Yeah, the 10 million. Right. right. You're in the <laughs> desert. You've been in the desert for 10 days. No water. Someone gives you a glass of water or a diamond. Which one are you taking? Yeah. Okay. I see your point. Yeah. The That's water. what it is. So it's not really arbitrary. It's deliberate. Because what people do is it's, it's Mark's notion of commodity fetishism, which they use in anthropology. You turn the commodity into a fetish and people don't see beyond it. I'll tell you some of the things that really amaze me. And I always discuss this with my students in my, my popular culture module. Yeah. yeah. You'll see things like on your newsfeed. Oh, you'll be amazed at the Beckham's 7 million refurbishment. Why? Because they've told Why would you be? But they've told you to be. They told you Exactly. To be. They're already telling you they've lined you up to be. Yeah. It would more be like, you'd be amazed if you see the hovel that the, that the Beckhams live in. Mm. But that's what they do. They set us up. So in some senses, <clears throat> we think they're arbitrary, but they're not. They're deliberate. Because that's why the things have, have particular types of value. Yeah. They know that if they went into Deptford Market and they said to someone, give me 100 quid for that stamp, they're going to go, you're mad. Yeah, yeah. That's what they do. It's, it's, yeah. You know, as I said, I'm not an economist, but I'm not a fool. Yeah. And I see certain things. And to me, it's, you know, it's, it's like aesthetics, you know, what difference is, it's like, for instance, you get companies like Levi's. Okay. So Levi's and they, they, they're on record for doing stuff like this. So I will just call them that unless they've changed recently. But Levi's would make, let's say they've got 100,000 pairs of defective jeans. These might just have the L in the wrong place. Yeah. Rather than give it to poor communities who could ill afford them, they'll burn them or destroy them. Why is that? Oh, my goodness. Because if you give them away, undervalues what, you, what it represents. Mm. That's why when people talk about Mansa Munsa, the richest person in history who 
You know, he went across Africa and he did the he did the Hajj because he was, oh. you know, a Muslim. It's not. And I said, yeah, it's great. He went across Africa and he threw away gold and he did this and he did that. It was when I met Professor Ekwe Ekwe, because that's the story I believed. And I used to say to people, like when I used to argue in white people, I used to say, you don't think you're rich. None of you are rich as Manta Munta. He could have bought up the whole of you and spat you out tomorrow. Mm. But when I met Prof Ekwe Ekwe, and this is what I'm talking about, balance. Yeah? When I met Prof Ekwe Ekwe, he said to me, yes, but... Um, because he used to call me Mr. Les. He goes, yes, Mr. Les, but do you know he destabilised every African community he went through? Mm. Because all the things that they valued became valueless because they had so much gold. Mm. It took them years the to re-establish those economies. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying there's always a flip side to those coins. Mm. But in this materialist world that we live in, you think about it. Why is a house worth 300000 in one place, yet you can buy something that is almost like a garage uptown for the same money? Yeah. £300,000. Because everything is artificial. Postcode, <laughs> lottery, all of these things, they're constructs. Mm. They're constructs. And, and I don't know how that system is going to ever be overthrown. I don't know. But what I do know... It can be. It well, can't to me, be. everything can be. But it can't, because it's the way that you actually process and understand the world. It, it, it's your only frame. By having um, binaries... Um, yeah. It's the only way that you can actually make sense of the world. It's true. It's true. It's true. So, it I, true. yeah. I... I the last question I was going to ask you, um, Prof, um, but then there was something else as well that I wanted to ask. But the last question around this activism thing that I wanted to ask is, how do the general black masses engage in activism on a daily basis? So, you know, recognising that they're not necessarily at that level of consciousness. Yeah. But let me give an example, like uh, consumption, which we're all very good at. Yeah. Know? How we are but I, I i would have said like something for example like um choosing to buy you know one item let's say that, not black pound day as such but choosing yeah yeah consciously decide that you're going to invest in a black um, um business um on a monthly basis alongside your normal shop i'm not saying stop as does or stop yeah 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 something that allows us to edge closer well, to me you've kind of hit the nail on the head because i'll be honest with you it was brother um, Kehinde um, Ogunlabi. Ogunlabi. I hope I've got his name right. Yeah. Brother Kehinde. He explained to me what Black Pound Day was because I didn't understand it. Yeah. I he explained it to me. And that for me is a perfect example of how you can do that. That encapsulates what you're asking me. Because I didn't, I, I thought it was just this little gimmicky thing, whatever. But apparently the person who, who put it forward is doing all these other things all the time in the local communities and beyond mm. to kind of conscientize people mm. about how you can actively support your own. Again, Malcolm X said it in one of his critiques. He goes, why are you always talking about you're going to boycott some cracker somewhere or whatever? He said, forget that and just support your own. Exactly. Exactly. But I think that is the best way to do that. And the Black Pound day for me or the black pound whatever it is it exemplifies that because although i thought it was reduced to a day as i yeah. said it was explained to me as something much broader reaching and sensible but people but but i have to tell you the truth um bro i've seen that the energy and the steam and the um level of um what well, engagement yeah that engage, it has significantly dropped you know, um, and there's actually been um, analysis. But is that is that because of COVID? No, because if you remember, Black Pound Day, didn't it start after George Floyd? Yeah, it started after George Floyd. But what I'm, what I'm thinking is, because I know people, for oh. instance, who would order, like, Caribbean stroke African groceries and stuff and get them delivered. Yeah. But to me, they're still doing that. So... You know, I'm not really in a position. So if you're telling me it's Wayne, then I'm not. So I, 
I'm not really surprised because maybe it was in vogue during that moment. Exactly. And this is what I'm saying. Like, I don't want us supporting ourselves to be a matter of something being in vogue or not. It should be a matter of course that we just do. But you see, you've got to be very careful about the collective we. And we've had this discussion before because one of the problems we face as members of the human family, and I will use the we in this sense, is we judge people out of our moral compass and oftentimes out of our commitments to mm. our struggles for emancipation That's and true. liberation. Whereas for me, there are certain people who won't do that. I think, I've, I don't know if I've told you this before, but years ago, I had a cassette from an African-American activist called D Knowledge. So that was his name. And what he basically said was, he said, you know, he was talking to, uh, I, I think he said, I was talking to a brother the other day and he said to the brother, oh, you know, that's a nice car. Where'd you get the car service? And he goes, oh, I go to blah, blah, blah. And he said, what? You go to the white mechanic. You don't use your brothers in or whatever is in the community. And he said, no, he goes, I gave them my car once and they really messed up my car. And he said, oh, OK. So he said, are they good? And he went, oh, no, this is the fifth white mechanic I've tried. Yeah. That for me. Yeah. I remember when I heard that, I was like, that is so true. Yeah. The amount of people I know, they'll have one bad experience with one yeah. black tradesman and they will go through rakes and rakes and rakes of white people. Yeah. White tradesmen. I've yeah. seen it myself when I used to do plumbing and heating. Um, anyway, sis, you stay blessed. Take care, sir. Right, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. See you later. Bye.